This is Amy Jenner. Thanks for your company this morning. With me now from the Institute of Public Affairs is Simon Brini for his thoughts on the Racial Discrimin Act, uh, Discrimination Act proposed changes. Simon, thanks for your time. Now, when you look at these this ex exposure draft, it looks like Section 4 basically undermines the rest of the proposal. Is that why you're welcoming it? Because it's basically effectively getting rid of 18C anyway, isn't it? It's certainly a significant proportion of the proposal. Um, we saw some real significant problems with 18C, and 18C on its own were, were had, some, had some big problems. Um, but some of the other problems were that 18D, which listed the exemptions under the existing law, and that's, that's still the law today, uh, was narrowed to conduct that on a, on a range of bases provided some exemptions, but you had to do those reasonably and in good faith for those exemptions to apply. Um, the current exemption under subsection 4, as you've said, is incredibly broad. It's, it's been broadened out to make sure that we don't have journalists going to court, as we saw at the end of 2011 would, would with Andrew catch, Bolt. Would, would this catch the Holocaust denier David Irving, though? Uh, would, it seems that it's so broad that even people like that would get away with that sort of speech. I think it probably depends in the way that it's done. Um, the, 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 the exemption is quite broad, and if it's, if it's written in a way that, you know, you're presenting an opinion piece in a newspaper or whatever, then that might not be caught. Um, but I think there's a really significant issue here, and that is, do we deal with racism using laws or do we deal with it through public discussion? Um, and it's my clear view that I think we should always deal with these things through, through public debate. We have to have an open and an honest debate about really controversial issues to ensure that we don't lock people up or we don't fine people, we don't, we don't uh, censure people for saying these things. We actually change their minds. What, the what, only do, what way do you to say do that to, is through what, discussion. What do you say to individuals? who would cop the racism, because it's fair enough for you and I to have that view, but we're not going to cop racist taunts, but those that do? Yeah, sure. Look, well, I think it's a great thing to get together with other community groups and make sure that you tell racists that their views are unacceptable, um, that it's not appropriate that those things are, are, are discussed and, and presented as fact. And I think you present historical figures and facts to say this is where you're wrong. Um, the other thing to say, though, uh, is, is that... There are other laws that deal with this sort of conduct. Um, we've got threats against violence, we've got threats against intimidation, there's harassment and other offensive uh, uh, law, laws against offensive language, for instance, at both the state and the Commonwealth level that deal with this sort of conduct. So um, Section 18C doesn't operate in on its own. There's all these other laws that complement that sort of thing as well. well but what's prompted this? Because it, it doesn't... <clears throat> the point that uh, the critics have ma are making of this is what, what's broken? There was the Bolt case, but was there any other case... Certainly the Bolt case brought it to, to uh, the forefront of the debate. Um, Section 18C existed for a long time and a lot of people saw Section 18C as, as when it was used against Bolt as being a serious over, overstep, of a serious overreach of this law. And I think it was very important that we had the Andrew Bolt case because it's given rise to a huge debate, not just about Section 18C, but about freedom of speech more generally in this country. But in, in terms of that, that uh, well, the reason for it, though... Uh, You've got so many groups coming out and condemning it. The Indigenous uh, groups, the, government, the Prime Minister's own advisory council chaired by Warren Mundine, he says he's <clears throat> offended by the changes. The Jewish lobby, I'm going to speak to Colin Rubenstein shortly, they've condemned it. So the government sure certainly hasn't brought a lot of the ethnic communities with them on this, have they? Well, it's interesting if you go back to the debate around when this was introduced in 1995, there were actually ethnic groups that came out and recognised that this law wouldn't be good for them. One of the reasons why they said that it wouldn't be a good law for, for particular ethnic groups was they recognised it wouldn't just be uh, dominant power groups and, and uh, lesser powerful groups taking issues through courts, as, as a lot of those proponents of Section 18C to, say today. They recognised that there'd be inter-ethnic rivalries that would play out through the courts and that that wasn't a good thing. Um, that hasn't happened. Do you, do you think the, the government will back away from this? Uh, the, the IPA, understandably, you're a think tank and, you know, a liberal one at that, so you would want as much free speech as possible, but the government's also got a political equation to weigh up here. What, would you expect them to water this down a bit? Uh, they, do, they do have to look at the politics. Um, it's, it's our clear view that I think they should actually go further than the exposure draft that was released yesterday. I think that... Section 18C should be repealed in its entirety. Um, we shouldn't have any laws in this area okay. um, that mean that journalists can be taken to court, but the steps that have been taken are significant and they're significant in the right direction. Simon, thanks so much for your time. Thank Simon you. Simon Brenning, appreciate it. Now, let's go live.